Hello and welcome to Undercurrent. Coles and Woolworths dominate the retail market in Australia and most of the time you may not even realise that you're buying from stores that are related. Whether it's Dick Smith, Bunnings or even Liquorland, all of these organisations are closely linked together. We wanted to find out a little bit more so we sent Nikita Dixon to investigate. Recent research from the Commonwealth Bank has indicated 40% of all retail spending ends up in the cash registers of either Coles or Woolworths. What we're seeing now is a concentration of the grocery market beyond that of any other country in the world. Meanwhile, the pressure's on for our independent sector, with both grocery giants on a path to increase their already staggering combined 80% market share. It is very, very, very disturbing because you go to places like Europe and so forth, the biggest, the bigger chains only control about 30 or 40 percent of the market share. We don't really see market share uh, as a critical uh, target at Coles. Uh, for us, uh, customers come first, and if we do the right things uh, so that more customers come through our doors, uh, then uh, the rest will take care of itself. I remember years ago when we had a service station at the corner and a lot of my customers said, oh, I'm going to that, I'm going to the coal service station because the, the, the petrol was cheaper. You look today, with all those years of them buying out service station sites and so forth for lowering the costs, the independents have gone, so I think that, I think that is quite disturbing. Well, I think there's no doubt that size provides uh, the opportunity to drive economies of scale. Uh, over the last uh, uh, two to three years and we've seen two million more customers come through our doors each week uh, and for us that's the most important metric uh, that we can achieve. Consumers have stood on the sidelines as supermarket heavyweights, Coles and Woolworths, battle it out over the price on groceries. Recently, the market has seen the introduction of the controversial Coles and Woolworths $1 milk and bread pricing campaign and the discount of thousands of shelf items to get customers through the door. We don't see uh, what we're doing uh, at Coles as head-to-head -head with any particular competitor. We actually see this as Coles versus Coles. The reality is that there are 30,000 retailers out there from the big stores right through to the mum and dad corner stores. So I, we see it as a very vibrant market and one which uh, provides lots of choice for uh, consumers. If Coles and Woolworths are able to get even bigger, we won't have any service as a consumer. We'll just go to a shop, okay, there's bread. That's only going to you're only going to buy the Coles bread or the Woolworths bread. So I think as a consumer, the, the, in years to come, the product range will become less and less and less. I think there, there are two very strong uh, supermarkets in Australia and it's great to have two competitors head to head offering great value for customers. But I don't think they're that dominant. I think there's lots of choice. Uh, and as I said before, we, we don't uh, see uh, Coles versus any other retailer uh, as an important objective. The best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and bees. I want money. The ACCC said earlier this year there was nothing inherently anti-competitive about Coles or Woolworths. 
We've already seen several of our independent grocery stores get the chop, each eventually being absorbed and rebranded under the Coles or Woolworths banner. With things set to heat up over the next five years for our grocery giants, will consumers continue to reap the benefits or will we begin to see the effects of a monopolised grocery market? Only time will tell. I'm Nikita Dixon for Undercurrent. Now, there's three Australians a day being diagnosed with oral cancer, and it's very often young people who haven't even been drinking or smoking. Now, it seems that it might be related to the human papillomavirus, which is also responsible for many instances of cervical cancer. We wanted to find out a little bit more, so we sent Jasmine York to investigate. There has been recent research into oral cancer and the human papillomavirus being a contributing factor. I went to speak to experts to see if this was true. There is a strong link. Um, just percentages in the United States, 60% of oral cancers, well I should specify oral pharyngeal cancers, are HPV positive and worldwide it's 36%. So there actually is quite a strong link and research is being undertaken as far as treatment and detection with the HPV virus because it's being found in younger people and people who don't smoke, who drink little. I think the link is approximately about, uh, at this stage I'm saying about 30, 40 to 55 percent or so and uh, it's mainly in the younger population. The effects of oral cancer are quite devastating and it doesn't matter what the etiology, what the cause is. They range from uh, loss of teeth to loss of bone to loss of tissues such as the tongue. As far as the public is concerned, if they find that they have, for example, red and white patches in their mouth, uh, if they have any ulcers that won't heal, any lumps or uh, lumps or hard areas in the mouth which may or may not be painful, they all need to be looked at by a dentist. There is a low survival rate with oral cancers and every day there are three people diagnosed with oral cancer. That is a, that's a huge problem that we have and as far as the survival rates, as I say, it's because that it's a late detection. So the public needs to know that they must attend their dentist regularly and have screening for oral cancers. Once it's detected, there are the tests that you can follow through if you want to make sure that it is uh, cancerous or not. Um, one of the simplest things is to do uh, a brush test, which is very similar to a pap smear, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then for something that's more definitive, you actually uh, cut it out and have a little sample sent to the lab and uh, get that checked out. How do you educate people on oral cancers? Pretty much campaigns like uh, what the uh, Australian Dental Association is doing lately with the Dental Health Week and uh, generally from dentists mainly and doctors just making sure that, you know, it is uh, um, you know, it is, it's been told to the patient and things need to be uh, looked after and watched out for sort of thing. And I suppose in a sense from the patient's point of view where if there's any changes or anything unusual in your mouth, you need to see a doctor or a dentist. With the HPV, um, men are at equal risk to women and that's with relation to getting a vaccine. They're actually looking at getting vaccines um, uh, for men as well as for, uh, for men taking the vaccines because the reason they're at equal risk is there is a combination of the HPV with penile cancers, anal cancers and oral cancers which makes it equivalent to women with um, cervical cancer so they're actually at equal risk. To minimise the risk is actually um, minimising the number of sexual partners that you have. The increase, the more sexual partners, the more risk there is of um, getting the HPV virus and again prevention as far as dental checks, regular dental checks and screening and that's something that we, we can't say enough because that's what's lacking in the community. 
the human papillomavirus does have connections to oral cancer, even though further research needs to be done. Going to your doctors for regular checkups can minimise the development of oral cancers. I'm Jasmine York reporting for Undercurrent. Every day it seems our police force are getting more and more powers. And many people think this is translating into WA becoming something of a police state. We wanted to find out what you, the people of Perth, think about that, so it's time for our Vox Pops. With the police pushing for more power, is WA becoming a police state? We asked the people of Perth. I definitely think it is, and I think it's becoming more so each year. Um, well, I think you need a police presence around. Well, I didn't think it was, actually. I think they're doing a really good job with the crime going at the moment. So I think it's a racist place for policemen because they uh, don't give uh, people a fair go as injustice, especially Aboriginal people uh, with Mr Ward and the, uh, the prison, prison system. Look at that Sunday trading. How pathetic is that? How disorganised is that? People want to have a choice. It's supposed to be a free, free state. You should be open up the shop. Should be open any time. I don't think you can consider it a police state. It's uh, it's okay as it is. They can maybe uh, get more powers in certain aspects. Private enterprise, isn't it? Free state. Trade when you want to trade. It's not it's all regulated. Everything's regulated here. At oh, my age, so I not... couldn't care less what it is. <laughs> I haven't got much more time to stay here. <laughs> Do you think the police should have more power in WA? I believe they have adequate powers to carry out their duties. Too much, too much police power. Plus it is, it's getting worse and worse and worse. They want power over everything. I guess with drug control and drug related incidents, that, that would be fair to give them more executive powers. No, no, not at all. I think it's enough what they have. In certain regards, but you can't say just across the board, can you really? Uh, some topics, not all. Just depends on what it is. I don't think it's a bad thing that they had, if they had more power, I just think that it would be used in the wrong kind of places, I guess, depending on which area and which aspect of their jobs. Do you think the police abuse their, the power that they have already? I don't think so in general. Maybe isolated cases, but as far as I'm concerned, it's OK. I do oh, think so. I, don't. I do think so. They have right. too, too much power. Yeah, definitely. Like, for example, I'm a pee plater and I get pulled over all the time. Even though I don't drink and drive, I don't, I'm not a hoon or anything. But it's just that sort of mentality that they think, they assume that anybody within that age range is likely to do something stupid. I, I think so, it is abuse. Look at the Triple C. If you don't answer their questions, and uh, you don't answer their questions, you get automatically two years jail. Now, if that's not psychological torture. I believe, like all organisations, there must be some certain levels of abuse because of individuals, but I don't believe it's endemic. Although most people believe that the police have enough power as it is, some people believe that the police abuse the power that they already have. I'm Sarah Miller for Undercurrent. Undercurrent is a West Australian show produced by West Australian people, so we are very interested in what you think. Why don't you come down and have your say in Undercurrent's Vox Pops that happen every Tuesday in the Murray Street Mall at noon. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Undercurrent. Buying, selling, renting or investing, Perth's property market affects us all. Time now for one of our regular segments. Let's find out what's happening in the Perth real estate market from Rewa. Is no news good news? Let's hope so where the WA and Perth property market is concerned. Looking at the stats this quarter, there's really been very little to shout about. So what is happening and what news is there to tell? Let's first get an overview from the man with the figures, Rewa's Director of Research, Stuart Darby. Well look, we're seeing the Perth median house price easing down very slowly uh, and we're seeing turnover quite flat, uh, so there's not a lot of sales activity. There's a lot of property still for sale, although that is starting to trend down, but the important thing there, that's keeping a lid on price. And the other one too, there's no real pressure in the rental market. So let's get out the graphs and show you where we're at. The preliminary median price for the June quarter suggests a fall of 3.1% overall, but once all the data is in, Rewa believes this will be near a 2.1%, with your average house in WA costing around the 475,000 mark. And compared to this time last year, that's a drop of 5%. 
Now, this latest quarterly decline is the fifth in succession, eclipsing the four-quarter fall in 2008. Now, looking at the initial proportion of sales data, which represents some 80% of the market, properties in the 350 to 500,000 range remained solid during the last quarter, at the expense of the 600,000 to $1 million range. It's worth noting that the proportion of sales in the 1 million plus market remain quite stable. So how's sales activity looking? Statewide house sales are estimated to have fallen 5% in the June quarter, with the annual turnover down 29% on a 15-year average. Preliminary estimates suggest that house sales fell 5-7% to in Perth after an 11% rise in the March quarter. In annual terms, turnover for 2010-11 was 27% lower than the 15-year average. And here's the real head-turner. The current state of the market is some 45% below the activity of 2005-06. Better news for regional WA where house sales increased slightly after a similar rise last quarter and turnover in the multi-residential market has fared better this time around with a small upswing in activity. And where first home buyers are concerned, the first home owners grant paid out this quarter has risen by 10%, the highest number since March 2010. Here's Stuart with more on that. We're seeing a 10% increase in the number of first home owners grants paid, so that obviously shows that first home buyers are obviously confident in the market. Uh, and they're representing 25% of, uh, of basically a weak market, and that's in line with our long-term trend of uh, first home uh, owners. And look, the other important one too, um, first home buyers don't buy the median house price, like 475000 in Perth. The latest data says that the first home buyer is actually uh, buying a median house price in the order of 413000 Let's look at listings then, and they've plateaued in Perth around 17,000 for much of the last quarter, peaking at 18,200 in mid-April, now around 16,300. Listings have fallen meanwhile in both Mandra and Bunbury. Average selling days continue to ease out, now at 79 days exceeding the peak in September 2008. Now you may remember last quarter we were optimistic that the rental market was on an upturn which could have preempted an upturn in sales. Well, that's not been the case, unfortunately. Rent stabilised last quarter. Here's Alan Burke. Even though the historical data is showing that rents have stabilised, what we're seeing right now, though, is competition in the rental market. We're starting to see multiple applications on properties, and we're starting to see rentals rise. And that's going to be the trigger point for the recovery in the marketplace. We'll see a number of tenants move out of the rental market and buy their own homes and we'll see a number of investors lured by the higher yields and the higher rents to come in and buy more property. So we'll start to see the stock levels drop in the marketplace and a little bit of relief in the rental market. So that's the beauty of the market, everything comes back to equilibrium. If you're working in the industry or trying to sell your home at the moment, you might find this all rather depressing, but you could look at it another way. You've got to wonder whether this now represents a fantastic time to buy. Solar panels were supposed to be the way of the future, but the government has just killed the rebate program, putting thousands of people out of work and killing a thriving industry. WA government has suspended the feed-in tariff scheme for solar energy. Customers are losing incentives to invest in solar panels, and the industry is struggling. The solar industry knew from May when the government announced their budget and said that they would cap the feed-in tariff at 150 megawatts, that there would be change, but they certainly didn't expect it to happen this soon. They anticipated that the cap would kick in in about September or October, so it gave them time to plan and to you know, organise their staffing arrangements. But because it happened without any consultation with the industry so that they could prepare, we're already aware that some companies have had to send orders back, other companies have talked about how they're going to have to lay off staff, and there's already you know, the impact for the consumer, who, with all the best intentions of the world, uh, wanted to put solar panels on their roof, not just to do the right thing environmentally, but also to try and reduce their power costs. They've also been, um, had the door shut on them as well. Any sort of announcement by the, uh, the government where they decide to uh, suspend or cancel uh, schemes that are no doubt very popular by the consumers is very disappointing. Um, the fact that the government had no consultation at all with the industry body, such as uh, businesses within the solar industry, made it very awkward to sort of comprehend as the reason of what direction the government was actually taking uh, with their announcement. The governments all around Australia, and including the federal government, 
keep introducing tariff uh, incentives and rebates um, and they're all inappropriately placed and so they're almost bound to failure because they're not properly designed. Um, and in this case, the state government totally underestimated the desire by the general population of West Australia to have solar power on their homes. And so the amount they set aside to cover that rebate was something like 20 to $30 million. And within just one year, it went up to $127 million. So they've run out of money. So it's not surprising they've had to pull it back. We're probably down on about 80 to 90% of general inquiries, which means a significant de decline in sales uh, generated revenue that we're currently experiencing. On a, um, where we may have been averaging anywhere to 400 to 450 leads per week, which are general inquiries, we've lost about 80 to 90% of those. So we may be getting 100 a week, not even that, nowhere near that, probably about 50 a week currently. Uh, with our workforce, we had nine sales representative in, just in the metro area, we're now down to four. So decrease in sales and inquiries means that unfortunately uh, your resources have to be capped and uh, where we are a strong advocate of in, in employing um, people and giving them work opportunities in the future, we're now actually having to let staff go, which has a dramatic effect. Just not on the, the morale of the business, but also it's uh, very upsetting and frustrating for those people that uh, no longer have a job. The main problems with the current system is they keep changing the rebates every few years, if not faster than that. And they do it in every state and at the federal level as well. What this does is they introduce a rebate scheme that looks good. So people get into the solar power industry, for instance, to put solar panels on people's houses. And uh, they employ people, they buy product, they install it, and then the government takes away the rebate or changes it. So the market disappears and those businesses find they've got all these employees that have no longer got anything to do. So the businesses start to go bankrupt. So they close up shop. Then the government brings in another rebate scheme and they employ, well, another whole set of people who employ people and they go through the same cycle again. This, this has been a bit of a slap in the face to people um, and it, it removes the incentive um, to actually encourage people to do the right thing. Without government's help, will there be a future in the solar industry in Western Australia? Ding Ding Down reporting for Ender Current. Thanks to John Hughes, it's time again now for Nick Hayes' regular segment where he talks to a well-known personality. This week he's talking to RSPCA's National President, Lynn Bradshaw, about all creatures great and small, the live cattle trade, and where a successful businesswoman finds the time to be involved with such a worthwhile organisation. Is it true this program was brought to you by WA's most trusted car dealer, John Hughes? Absolutely. Lynn, thanks for joining us. The RSPCA has had a fairly big 12 months. Yes. One, one issue in particular has been the, uh, the live trade of cattle. Where, what is the position of the RSPCA on that? Well, the RSPCA has had a long-standing position that it opposes live export on the grounds that um, the animal welfare component just doesn't exist. What is your direction as the President for the RSPCA? Where do you want to see it in the next 12 months? If we considered it from sort of 12 months to five years in terms of our strategy, we'd very much like to engage the public in um, really bringing them on board with how to choose products from the supermarket uh, when they're buying their goods uh, to take home to the family. Um, we have um, an accredited food process um, and we have uh, RSPCA labelling. We're trying to roll that out across the country. It is a national organisation. How many members do you currently have and sort of what kind of people these days get behind the RSPCA? Well it's very important actually to recognise that the RSPCA represents mainstream Australia. So middle of the road, the general public, the average person in the street and those are the people that we engage with. So we have members and we have supporters and between the two um, we're really represented very highly. So 65% of the population is on board with the RSPCA in some way. It's not all about cats and dogs. We are talking all animals, great and small. Is that the, that's the line, isn't it? It is, for all creatures, great and small. So you can imagine, Nick, that that is a very big brief. 
yeah. all creatures great and small, and where does that leave the RSPCA? In terms of what creatures we support, you mentioned dogs and cats. The public is more in tune every day, day to day in their daily lives with companion animals. So companion animals is where dogs and cats fit, dogs, cats, birds. Well, mine's a very funny story, actually. Side of that, if you think about um, intensive farming, so on animals that are used um, in production, for food. The RSPCA plays a very big role there in working with the producers, government, working with industry uh, to further the cause of animal welfare within those uh, production um, farming uh, role. What motivated you to get involved with the RSPCA? Well, mine's a very funny story, actually. We'd moved to Australia in 1985, and there was quite a series of um, very nasty-looking um, complaints on the television. And there was one particular case against some dogs, and I got so upset in my kitchen, I said some very nasty words to the television and started to point, why doesn't somebody do something? And my husband got really annoyed and he said, look, are you going to serve me my dinner or what here? He said, are you going to shout at the television? He said, if you really feel that strongly, could you please go out and do something about it? Mm. So I thought, right. <laughs> so I phoned the RSPCA. But what I didn't realise in WA at the time, it was a very small operation with very limited funds and very limited coverage. So I set about, you know, joining and trying to help in the shelter, well there was no shelter, but trying to help with the, the volunteer side of it. And very soon it became obvious that I had other skills that we could use and I basically I've gone from there. Lynn, what do you love about Perth? I think it's a very exciting environment here and certainly coming from Europe it's what I call a lot more civilised in terms of the culture is a little bit more laid back. Uh, believe it or not, I believe we work harder in, in WA than we do in, in say, Europe. Mm. Um, but it's um, very much then, at least when you do relax, you can go out and get fresh air and you can go and look and do, do other things that really don't belong to an office environment. Well, that's another episode of Undercurrent done and dusted. But don't worry, we'll be back again next week. If you've got any comments on any of the stories you've seen tonight, or perhaps even suggestions for stories that we should be doing in the future, you can get in contact with us here at West TV. Check our website, wtvperth.com.au, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll be back again next week. I'm Jason Jordan. Good night.